you said at the beginning, how, why me? Why, why, you know, you know, we always have these whys. But why did you take my mom from me when things were seemingly going okay? I would say that my why me, that I had asked God for 30 plus years since I was a little girl, turned into, why did you choose me? I began to realize to suffer is divine. It's true because Paul says, I glory in my affliction. Paul says, I glory in the things that I've suffered that the power of God may rest on me. Good evening, everybody. I am here with a very special guest, straight out of uh, Michigan, um, and she'll tell you where she's from, but I'm excited to be with her tonight. This is our first show. It's called um, Overcomers. We are Overcomers, and boy, do we have a story for you tonight. I am telling you, this young lady is just anointed. She's in love with the Lord. And uh, when you hear her story, you will, your life will be touched. And she has a couple of books coming out. And we want to talk to her about her books. One is in poetry and the other is, is, a, is her wife's story. And they are so powerful. And uh, I couldn't let this moment pass without allowing her to share her story with you all. And... Um, Without any further ado, I, I want to introduce to you Miss Angela Burbitz. Could you introduce? Hi. Me? <laughs> okay. So, Angela, um, my question for you is: What, first of all, what inspired you to write a book? Ah, uh, it has been in my heart for a long time to write my life story. Um, and I believe ultimately it is to help other people. Um, for most of my life, that's, that's what I, I yearned to do was to, to help other people. Um, and uh, that is what has inspired me to write my life story. It is. It's the main reason. Amen. Amen. So, can I ask you a question now? Could you tell us briefly? Um, I, I got several questions I want to ask you, but um, so our audience can get a, a an understanding. Now, you I, I know you've written two books, and uh, could you could you tell us why two books? Why why is one poetry and why is the other one the story? What was, what did that come from? Uh, I started writing poetry about 26 years ago. <laughs> um, and in the original format, I had the poetry and the testimony book all put together. Um, <laughs> and through the leading of the Holy Spirit and some advice from a trusted friend, I decided to separate the books. Um, and, uh, and I guess, I mean, that's, that's the reason I believe that the Lord wanted them to be separate. Mm -hmm. uh, so does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, that, that, that's, okay. that's good. So, but uh, when we talk about now when the poetry, what is it really, uh, what kind of poetry? Is it just, uh, mm -hmm. I'm in, is, is it pose? Is it, you know, what, what are you saying in the poetry? I wrote the poetry at times when uh, I was going through pain, um, you know, going through unknown situations, nowhere to turn, you know, really. I wrote a lot of the poetry when I had nowhere to turn. And so throughout my writing, uh, you can see the transition of me finding my way to the Lord. 
And so, you know, he was always there with me, but I didn't know it in the beginning. <laughs> and so you kind of see this lost young woman um, searching for Jesus. And he was, he was right there. He was right there. Um, but you can read the poetry and see kind of the moment that I realized, wow, he's right here with me. Yes. Praise the Lord. Um, and so it's so powerful. Uh, it's just so powerful because we're searching for him all of us and and it took a lot of pain for me to realize it was him that i was looking for and if i can spare somebody that pain that is my life's mission amen yeah. i think angela that's all of our life's mission is to it's to, it's to share our experience and, and the experience is a great teacher and if you don't have to go through some fires it is surely so much better to learn from someone else. I thank God for good parents. But uh, sometimes we don't always have what we need when we are coming up. And I know most of the people that's watching us, you know, I'm sure that they can have a testimony and say that, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't have a silver spoon in their mouths. Yeah. Everything at home wasn't right. Now, the name of your poetry, what's the name of your poetry book? Uh, to Suffer is Divine, The Revival of the Soul. Mm, to Suffer is Divine, The Revival of the Soul. And what about your main book? Uh, my testimony book is called From Murder to Grace. Ah. A Testimony of Beauty for Ashes. <laughs> okay, so could you, now, now that you've said that, could you tell us something about the, okay, your, your testimony book? Because that's what I want to get into. I've seen some of it, and I tell you, I can't wait till it come out. It's, it's, just, it's going to be, wow, it's a story. It's a story. Could you just briefly start at the beginning and unravel some of the highlights within the book? you know, when it started and a little further sure. along, without going through all the details, try to hit, the, you know, how life started for you as a little girl. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my parents were, were not married when I was born, but they did end up getting married. Um, however, they ended up getting divorced. <laughs> um, I went through... Um, you know, being molested as a young child. Uh, and from that moment, kind of everything changed for me, but I didn't really know it. And so from there, it was, um, you know, my mom doing drugs, my dad doing drugs. My mom goes to prison when I was eight years old. Now my dad has us. Um, and so we're living with him, with my grandparents. Um, and uh, this whole time, I kind of was like, hey, What's wrong with me? You know, <laughs> why am I not good enough to be loved? Mm -hmm. And so it was a big hole in my heart. And um, I'd say probably around 12 years old, I just started kind of looking outside in, in the world for, okay, what, you know, what can fill this void, you know? Um, and I, I, you know, I had friends and, you know, we got to drinking and we got to smoking and, you know, by now I'm in my teenage years. And then I had a baby at 16 and I, I was already ran away from home. And, um, when, when I turned 18, uh, I ended up in jail, uh, the, and I was facing life in prison. And that's kind of the turning point of my life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is the title of the book, From Murder to Grace, because I was involved in a murder case. So I was in a vehicle when people went in and killed people. Um, horrible, 
horrible, horrible time. And I had no idea that they were going to do that. Um, and I was just kind of along for the ride, you know, where do I fit in? Okay. You know, I can fit in with this, with this gang, you know, I can fit in. They, they love me, you know, they're down for me. You know, they, they have my back and, uh, they didn't have my back. They didn't have their own back. They were lost. And so from that point in my life, um, I live in a, in a fairly small town. And so my, my face was on the front page. Um, I, I just kind of, I, I didn't even have my identity at that time. And I, I just began losing myself in pain and rejection. Um, Can I ask you a question? Sure. When you was in that state, I, I want you to keep your, th your, your thoughts. When you were, you said that you were searching. And and do you at the time I'm sure you 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 didn't know what it was but you was you you wanted to be connected is that I mean was it you wanted um I wanted to be loved you wanted to be loved I wanted to be loved I I believed at that point in my life that there was one man that was made for me mm -hmm. <laughs> and um that if I found him I would I would be complete and I would be whole, and he would make everything better. Mm -hmm. And uh, turns out that that's true, somewhat. <laughs> but that man is Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, that's and, the same uh, one for all of us, you know. Yeah. But, but I, I wanted to say this because when you are, uh, you were 18 years old, and you yeah. were going through a period of your life, of you were searching. Like many people that will be watching this 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 life, they're searching, they're searching. And, and then you end up in a situation where, and the name of your town is? Battle Creek. Battle Creek, Michigan. Yep. So you, you're, in, you're in Battle Creek, Michigan, and somehow you're in a car or some vehicle with a couple of people or two or three people or? Three. Three other three people. Others. And you, you, what now, what, what, what was going on? What, how'd you get in that situation first? How did you get in that situation? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I kind of just started hanging out with random people. And um, there was a one female friend of mine that I was hanging out with quite a bit at that time in my life. Um, in fact, I had met her when I was 17. And, um, oh, we were party girls. You know, I mean, I had a fake ID. I, I went to the club, you know, and all the while I had a daughter at home. Um, but she introduced me to these, these gang members. I mean, there were more than just three of them. There was an entire gang of these people. Um, they called themselves 187. And, uh, you know, I just thought I was cool. You know, I went to, I would say a preppy school in, in our town and um, I lived in a rich neighborhood. Okay. With my grandparents um, for a long time, we lived on the country club, you know, I mean, um, and I just thought, you know, I am cool. I fit in. This is, you know, this is, this is fun. I, um, I had no idea the level you know that gangs would go to you know i'm thinking okay you know we're smoking weed we're drinking and uh just hanging out and partying but um you know gang members do crazy things i mean that that's what a gang is you know they um they're hopeless they're they're also searching for love you know so that's how I got in that situation. Um, and just hanging out, you know, hanging out in the car and, you know, driving around drinking and smoking. And, you know, they start talking about, you know, this is what, you know, they want to go and rob these, these women. And, you know, they've got a lot of money and oh my God, no, I don't think so. I have a daughter that's just not happening. No way. You know, and I remember vividly, uh, it was a no for me. It was no, no way, no. And and it was 
I was in the back seat uh, at this time and uh, suddenly, you know, it was like um, something came over me. And it was, it, I know now, it was, it was the peace of God that came over me and sat me back and just had me agree to it. Um, and I know, I'm, I'm, I know that it is because they were going to do that one way or the other. And that was my vehicle. I was their ride. And so I sat back and I agreed, okay, you know, I, I'm not going to go in, but I'll, I'll be in the car and you guys can, you know, and, and in my naive mind, you can go in and you can get a little money and you can come right back out and it'll be done, you know. And uh, it didn't work like that at all. It, it was, um, it was horrible. It was horrific. It was uh, a nightmare, you know, it was a nightmare. And, um. I sat in the car for God only knows how long, but I would guess about two hours. I fell asleep in the car, you know, um, and when I woke up, I woke up to complete chaos. Uh, I woke up to them, two of them screaming, you know, um, those women didn't live and that wasn't their words, you know, they were very graphic and they just kept saying it, you know, those women didn't live, those women didn't live. And, you know, I'm waking up and what, what are you talking about? You know, I still, I'm just sitting there by this time I'm in the passenger seat and I'm just kind of like, what do you mean? These women didn't live, you know? And, uh, we get to going down the road and one of them had a huge knife. He just hands it to me. And uh, I, I didn't, I didn't touch it, but it was, I guess at that moment, you know, I, you know, I jumped away, but I, I realized um, this is serious. There's blood all over this knife and it's a butcher knife. And so at that moment I was in shock, utterly in shock. No. Mm. And uh, we we just went on about the night. I mean, it's just so crazy, you know, to think that, you know, even after that, even knowing, okay, I don't know what happened, but I know something happened. You know, I was just still loyal to these people. And so I went and got them clothes and, you know, we went over to my Aunt Sharon's house and we, we hung out and long story short, one of them got arrested that night for something else <laughs> that he had done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was free for two or three days after it happened. But, you know, the ironic part of it is that at that time in my life, I didn't believe in God. Mm -hmm. I was questioning whether he existed. I, I wanted to know, God, if you're so real, why would you allow me to go through so much pain? If you're so real, God, why do you allow us to go through these things? Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I, I just, I questioned his existence. And one more I think, thing. You know, it, we, we all do that. You know, there are times when life is painful. Yeah. They're very, they're painful moments in life. And when you're young and you're not, you're not even formed in your thoughts and, and then you, from your background, from what you told me, your mom at eight years old, you, she, she's just snatched out of your life. And then you, you, you just, from, you're molested and your mom, your mom leaves and, and then you're molested and all these things are happening and all this stuff is just going on. And there's so many people that may be right where you are right now. Uh, where, where you've been, they may be there right now trying to figure out life and why is this happening to me? Yeah. Why is all of this happening to me? Whew. And then, and then you, you, you go through the situation and then you somehow land in jail from what happens after that? I wound up in jail for um, six felonies. Five of them were life sentences. Um, none of them were, uh, 
I wasn't arraigned on murder. So I was arrested on open murder. They, they wanted to scare me or whatever the reason, but, um, I ended up spending 60 days in jail and, uh, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, five of my, my life sentences, the only life sentences I had, I had five life sentences I was facing and, um, they, they were dropped for lack of evidence because I wasn't in that building. Um, they had no, they had no evidence. They literally had not one piece of evidence against me or to, um, show that I was inside there. So the judge had no choice, but to drop those charges. And, um, but I was still facing one charge of accessory after the fact of murder. And eventually they offered me immunity to testify against all three of them. Mm -hmm. And so then that rigmarole started and I began one by one individual trials testifying against each one of these men. In the meantime, my life was unraveling. I was losing jobs, family, friends. Um, people assumed that I got away with murder. To this day, some people believe that I got away with murder. So in the long run, I, I have no record. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's how you know that God is on your side. That's how you know that he always had a plan for this. Um, because I have no record. I have an arrest record, but I have no record, no felonies, no misdemeanors from that case. Um, but the pain of, the pain of what people believed about me drove me right into the arms of the devil, I guess is the best way to put it, right into the arms of the devil, whether it be through drinking, uh, drugs, men, fake friends, um, you know, trying to, to, you know, even, you know, trying to feel better about who I was by getting a good job and, and getting a degree in college and all these things, trying to prove to even my family that um, I wasn't what they thought, you know? So it was kind of like fighting from the bottom to begin with, you know? It was unfair from the beginning because I was always the underdog, you know? Um, and the truth is that we all have an identity that we're looking for and we can only find it when we find the Lord, mm -hmm. you know? In him is who we are, you know? And it doesn't matter what anyone thinks or what they may say. Um, you know... The thing that comes to me when I when I hear your story is this, it, it brings tears to me because so many so many young ladies and young men right now are going through something and they don't understand they don't know why um, and it seems so unfair but you know and I, I know you're gonna get there there is a God there is a God. And there is a man that we all, we may look for a woman or a man, but in the end, you find, if you search with all your heart, you will find that man. Hallelujah. Other than the Lord. Yeah. Jesus. And what, kind of fast forward a little bit. So God got you out of that miraculous. And did any of the, did any of the gentlemen come to any kind of agreement that they say, she, she was not a part of it. Did they, they all help you or did they? Yeah, actually, um, the one that I was dating, the one that, um, the one of the three co-defendants that I was dating at that time, he actually um, told the police that I didn't know anything about it and that he had told them that I went in, that he went in there to get money that they owed him. So, um, yeah, so, you know, he stuck up for me and he, he knew, 
the level of innocence, you know, the how naive I was. Mm -hmm. He knew I had no idea that they were going to do that. I, I don't know whether they knew that they were going to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't so, know. So when after this period of time, let's fast forward. And you say it drove you into the arms of the devil because of the rejection that you kept experiencing. Was that it? Was the that you kept? Was it? Was it? Did you literally experience rejection, or was it you thinking rejection? Or, you know, it was both. It was. It was both. Um, I lost a lot of jobs. I had um, one employment agency tell me that if I didn't cut and dye my hair, I would never work in Battle Creek again because my hair is red and and I'm unique looking. Um, but I would, I also had a complex. So wherever I went, I would assume, oh, they know who I am. They know I'm that girl. They, they saw me on the front page, you know, and it began to drive me crazy. So when you say the front page, you mean of your local paper or was it nationwide paper? What was it at? It was uh, local and it was, uh, it was on America's Most Wanted. Wow. It was, yeah, it was maybe worldwide as well. I, I don't know. Um, but it was the most heinous crime that had happened in Battle Creek in 44 years. <laughs> so it was very serious around here. And at that time, there was maybe a hundred thousand people in our city. And so, you know, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. And uh, everybody, everybody, you know, they, they knew who I was somehow, you know, but, um, but the worst part was that I didn't know who I was. <laughs> The worst part was that I didn't know that I was loved. That even if I had went into that building and I had murdered those women with my own hands, that the Lord died for my sins. Amen. Amen. And that he covers all sins. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to measure sin, but sin is just sin. It's just ugly and it's rotten. Whether you're lying, you're thieving, you're murdering, it's all the same in God's eyes. And so I'm just, I'm thankful that, um, that it doesn't matter anymore. Amen. It doesn't matter anymore. So, you know? so you begin to move on and you said you made some, you, you went into the arm of the enemy. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't want to go into all that, but I want to know how, what, brought you out what what how how did how did what what shifted your life um well I had to go through a lot of horrible things and so what actually woke me up was being raped when I was 34 34 so about six years ago um I, I was raped by somebody that I knew and had dealt with and had been with, and I was devastated. And at that moment in my life, I began to question every decision that I had ever made, every friend that I had ever confided in or trusted. Um, and, and the Lord really began to separate me and show me, wait a minute. You know, these people are not your friend. Most of them do not care about you, you know. <laughs> and so, um, and so, yeah, that really was my moment of reckoning. Um, what, did you have any kind of background of Christianity? I mean, who, I mean, your mom and your dad, they weren't living for God, right? 
No, my grandparents did take us to church, my brother and I, and I was well, actually. You got some understanding about God through your grandparents. Yeah, I was an usher. I um, I was in the choir. I was in the the youth group mm. as a child. Yeah, mm. I was. It was a Methodist church. It was a very quiet church. So um, it was a religious church mm -hmm. it was uh not the love of jesus mm -hmm. i guess is the best way to put that but but there was some type of seed sown absolutely that caused you when you got in your crisis to think of christ absolutely. so when you came out of that situation from being raped at 34 years old what actually happened inside of you, in your heart, in your mind? It was you say it was the friends, but was I want to die. I wanted to die. I had my suicide planned out. I um, I couldn't trust anyone anymore. I broke up with the boyfriend that I had. Um, I I couldn't have sex i um i couldn't function and i didn't want to live and um <laughs> i was at work writing poetry feeling like dying and um the radio station just happened to quote a bible verse for the day and it was romans 8 to 8. so every day this radio station that i listen to quotes a bible verse and this specific day, which was, I believe, 9-11 of 2014, if I'm not mistaken. They played Romans 8 to 8, and, and it's, um, for we know that all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And when I heard that the Bible verse, I, I asked God right then, I said, God, all things? And he said, all things and he was loud in my ear and I said God even my mistakes and he was even louder and he said all things and at that moment was my the beginning of my faith walk I said God I believe you I believe you Lord all things are gonna work for my good Amen. Amen. and uh and I began my faith walk I began to have faith in things I did not see um, and I was, I was baptized uh, two years later, about, about a year and a half later in 2016. And uh, I was a big mess even then. You know, I was addicted to pills and weed and um, I couldn't drink anymore. I stopped drinking after that happened to me. Um, but I was just, I was a mess. But when... When I was given the Holy Spirit, when I was baptized, something happened. And it was like a fire began inside of me to purge all the necessary things that had to that he had to do away with. And uh, you know, it started with him letting me know how much I'm loved. And I think that that is what we all really want. We all really want to know that even in our darkest moment, in our worst day, that we're loved. And, uh, and we are. Right. And to know that, it just, it started something inside of me. It was a love story, the greatest love story that I'll ever have. And there's no turning back. So, what have you learned as far as God's role in your life and in the believer's life? Because you said at the beginning, "How? Why me? Why? Why? You know, you know, we always have these whys. But why did you take my mom from me when things were seemingly going okay?" And then why did you put me in this situation? Why did you let this happen? Why, why? And you said, 
you have to go through all this pain being molested at an early age and then going to a situation where you 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 got five life sentences i was facing five life sentences oh, and 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 that's got to be overwhelming for a young woman a young man anybody yeah and they ask the question why why? You know what I'm getting out of? One thing I've gotten, I want you to tell me, but man, no matter how deep the hole is. That's right. No matter how deep it is. That's right. No, it, it, you know, I always, you know, in our mind, we want, we want everything to be pristine, perfect. Yeah. But God is so intelligent. <sighs> God can take something that is so broken, so torn down, and in the midst where there's really no, no semblance of what holiness is, what righteousness is, no desire to, to, to be in love with God, to worship God, it's a routine. And somehow in that routine, a little seed was sown. Yeah. Wow. To me, that's powerful. That gives me hope for so many millions of people that are going to watch this, that are out in the world, and that you know, you might think they're going to get lost, but God has a way yeah. of getting that good heart. He knows fertile ground, and you, my sister, were fertile ground. So how, did, how do you see in how God has worked in your life and how he works in people's lives to answer that question, why? Hmm. How do you answer that now after going through what you've gone through and where you are now? an author of two books, not having all the pieces there, and, and, and you had enough in you to, to write this painful story, memory, hurt, yet, what about that why now? What do you see, what do you say, what, do you, what did you learn about why, and what, what, what would you say to somebody listening to you about the why they may have? I would say that my why me, that I had asked God for 30 plus years since I was a little girl, turned into why did you choose me? I began to realize to suffer is divine. And I began to see that he chose me for this purpose, for his glory, to help other people, just like my heart always wanted to. You're about to make me shout. I'm sorry, please. Yeah. I know this is an interview, but my goodness, that's <laughs> preaching. you're preaching to me right now. <laughs> hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Praise God in the highest, because he has, a reason for every pain, everything. He knows the end from the beginning. You know, he chose me to shine his light to the darkest places, to the people who don't feel that they deserve it. And they're wrong. And the world has probably not told them they're loved. And the average church has probably not told them they're loved no matter what. And my life is a testimony to God's love. And so my why me, it changed. And, and I, I feel that he chose me for pain. He chose me for a purpose. If you look at Jesus, he chose his son for greatness. But what did it require? Suffering and pain all the way to the cross. He shed his blood. And this was all God's divine plan for redemption of mankind. And so my, my, my rejoicing is that my life will bring light to the dark places in someone's heart where they don't know the Lord. And, uh, and it's an honor and a privilege when you realize that you went through all of it for him. 
it's a uh, you know, every time I think about it, it just, it brings tears to my eyes and a joy in my heart. And I'm so grateful that he gave me the strength to endure all of those things. And uh, he's sovereign. He's sovereign. He is in control. He knows it all. He's, like you said, he's so intelligent. He knows what we're going to do before we do it. And... Uh, Ultimately, he just wants us to be with him in heaven. And uh, I'm just, I'm grateful. I feel, I feel chosen and I feel loved. I know that might sound crazy, but. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not because it's true. <laughs> it's true because Paul says, I glory in my affliction. Paul says, I glory in the things that I've suffered that the power of God may rest on me. God, when, see, hard times has a way of humbling some of us. Maybe not all of us, but if you humble yourself, God will give you grace. And I believe God has graced you. That's why I believe he's chosen you. He chose you for pain like he chose many others. Throughout history, like many other Christians have suffered. And everybody has their own story. That's right. And we don't have to be condemned about our story. Because he erases all the bad. Because all the bad news is wrong because of the blood. Hallelujah. And we all need it. Amen. You know? Mm -hmm. Paul said, Paul said, you know, I consider it a small thing to be judged by men. You mentioned that people, you would go places and people would look at you or stare at you. And, and I can only imagine what it felt like, you know, because I've been in situations where um, I was guilty no matter what. And it's, it's a sting. And, and, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that, that when you say you had your, your note ready, you had a note for suicide, I'm so grateful that you're still here among us to be a light because God was not finished with you. Hallelujah. You know, oftentimes we want to take the pen and throw it down, but God says, I'm still writing. I'm still writing your story. And you let him write your story. And he's written so much that he got you to write your <laughs> story. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it yeah. amazing? It How is. God can, can just bring us to that place that, where we need to be, where he wants us, us to be. This is a tremendous story. And um, I can't wait. Uh, I know you got a book coming out probably in another week or two. That's your poetry book. And then later, your testimony is going to come out. And I tell you what, when people read that book, um, stick with us here at Overcomer. And I will let you know, uh, I will stay in contact with my sister and she will let me know when her, her testimonial book come out and when her poetry book come out. I, I pray that you all will support her because it's a story. Everybody knows somebody that's been through a storm. Yeah. Everybody's been through something. And some things you can't learn unless you go into a storm. It's just... You, you have to have storms. Nobody wants them. But Angela, your spirit is so sweet. It's so, having to endure 15, 20 years of being talked about, of being looked down at, it, it, it was hard. But you said something that, that and I'm going to ask you this. What is the greatest lesson? Because I, I think I know, but I want you to, out of your own spirit, what was the greatest lesson through all of this that you, that you get? That it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they think. That it, it only matters ultimately what God says about me. And that Jesus paid a high price for me, and I'm loved. And that's the greatest lesson that I learned through all of that, is uh, I don't have to search anymore to where I fit in. 
I don't have to have acceptance because I'm already accepted. He died on the cross and shed his blood. And he would have did it just for me, just for you, any one of us. That's love. That's love. Amen. The greatest love, you know, we can ever know. It is love. It's, 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 it's ridiculous love. Yeah, it is. It's ridiculous love because, we, you know, wow, you, you just, it's just moving for me to hear, hear this story and to see that you, you don't, you didn't get bitter. Mm. You didn't, you, you may have gone through some valleys, but you came out. That's right. There were times in my life when I was angry and I was bitter. Um, and I may have had right to be angry and bitter, but it didn't do me any good. And he delivered me from it through forgiveness. I began to forgive anyone and everyone that ever hurt me, including myself. And sometimes that's the hardest person to forgive. <laughs> There's so much power in forgiveness. Wow, what a lesson though. I think at the end of the day, we all search for love. And to learn that the creator that knows everything about you, that he sent you into a situation, he knew. You know, we don't, we don't say, hey, God, you know, if we had any control, we'd say, God, let me be born into a family that's uh, average. I don't want to be in no poverty. I don't want to be in no drunk house. I don't want to be in no drug house. Uh, I don't want to get ever get raped. I, you know, we tell God, if, if we could, before we got <laughs> here, we could be telling God all these things, but that's not how he, do, he they does it, is nope. it? And um, that's why we can't condemn people. We can't look down on people. We don't know their story. Amen. God is writing a story and everybody's story is different. Your story is different, but your story, my sister, is going to help many people because God, my bishop told me, son, God chose you to be picked on because he knew your heart was going to come back to him no matter what. And she said that he has to take some of us so close to the world because many of us that have never had to endure these processes, that have had certain privileges and certain things, we just won't go to certain places. So in God's infinite wisdom, he allows different things to happen. And I'm sure you still can connect with certain people that if it were not from where you come from, you would still be like, who are you? What are, you know? But you don't look down on anybody. And that's what Jesus wants to be. You know, when Jesus came, he came for the lost. And he, he gave you a heart to where you will love everybody. Because you knew, and, and you know in your heart where you came from. And so you don't have a choice but to love everybody. And I want to close today. I want you to close us off. And I want you to close us off in a prayer. And I want you to speak right now what's in your heart. I want you to tell, tell somebody that's going to be listening to this. Tell them what's in your heart, Angela, and close us in a word of prayer. To anyone who is listening to this that may relate to my story, I would say just call out to Jesus. Say his name, and you'll never be the same. He's waiting on you. He is waiting for you. He is knocking at the door of your heart. And he loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you. And uh, Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would touch the hearts of your children and your people, Lord. That you would show them through the testimony of myself and others, that it is you that they long for, that you would show them that the emptiness that they feel can only be filled by you, Lord, that you would come into their hearts, speak to them, 
Give them peace. Guide them along the way. Show them what your will is for their life, Lord. And all this I ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to say to the audience, I pray that you will share this video, uh, this testimony. Tell people about uh, Angela's books that are coming out. The first I also one. have a website. Okay. It's called FromMurderToGrace.org. Okay. And it's um, 1M, FromMurderToGrace.org, with 1M. Okay. And we'll put that, uh, we'll have it run across the screen and uh, so people can see that. And um, I thank you for your testimony. It is a blessing to have you to share your experience and someone is going to be touched by this and it's gonna change their life, Angela. You're already making a mark. So thank thank you. you so much for um, for everything, for being my big brother and for guiding me and uh, just everything that you do for the Lord. I know you do it for the Lord, but um, you've made a big difference in my life and I know I'm not the only one. And uh, I'm so grateful for you and uh, I'm so thankful that God gave me a big brother and I love you. I love you too, sister. And listen, we here at uh, From Darkness to Light Ministry, we're all about reaching people to bring hope. And that's why we named this program Overcomer. And today you've heard an overcoming story from Miss Angela Berbitz. Pray for her and pray for her continued success. Until next time.